we're going to change focus now and we're going to start looking at apps and what do apps mean for arts organisations. We're going to have uh, Mark Bamber uh, talk through a whole bunch of uh, apps that are related to the arts world, uh, which I think is going to be a very interesting thing to see some, uh, some real world examples. And then we've got Chris Thorpe, who's going to be showing us the latest on Art Finder, and I think it's really the latest, I think he's working on it right now. So the first thing I want to admit uh, is that I am an appaholic. Uh, I really became obsessed with apps uh, when I... I'm, going to, I'm admitting a lot of things that are going to be bad for me in the long run, but that when I bought my, uh, my iPad, uh, and after a bit, I, sort of, I, was, I was getting games, I was getting sort of painting devices, I was getting art anthologies, I was, I was hoovering up apps uh, to the level of my wages, you know, basically I was just, just leaving a little bit there for milk and bread. So, you know, like any uh, alcoholic, uh, uh, you have to at a moment think, well, what is driving this? Why on earth am I obsessed about these tiny little fragments of software? Whereas before, I was obsessed with large-scale, lovely, big applications that sat on your desktop. So, I was thinking about this on the train this morning, because I really have got to get to the bottom of it quite quickly. Uh, and I thought, well, the first thing is, is that I'm obsessed with the idea that now I have a technology, you know, like when you've got a, um, uh, an iPhone or an Android phone in your hand or whatever device it is, you kind of want that device to become more and more useful over time, not less. You know, the standard thing is that they over, you get like a new camera and you're really loving it for a while. And then about a year in, it's like, it just somehow seems less useful. And then like two years after, it's like, it's sort of old and I don't really like it. And I can't really put my finger on why, right? But the interesting thing about apps is they constantly refresh the usefulness of your device. They tell you that there's something else that it can do that perhaps you couldn't do a minute ago. So that was one thing. And then I thought, well... The other thing I have to just admit is that I am looking for new experiences. I'm looking for a thing that's going to enable me to interact with this device in an interesting and exciting way, something that I, I wasn't doing a minute ago. Now, quite often that'll be a game app. Uh, for me, it's a lot of painting apps. And, you know, I don't even want to show you how many painting apps I've got, but it's a fair number. Right? And what I'm looking for each time is, how have they developed this idea? How have they made this experience more pleasurable? How are they making it something that I can use as part of my life? And then, at its most highfalutin, and I really only reserve this for you guys, is uh, I think that apps and the development of apps have started a new kind of conversation in technology. And what happens is this, is one developer, it might be just one on their own, comes up with a neat idea. Uh, that one of the neat ideas was that there was this great drawing application, uh, a flash drawing application. No, sorry, it was a HTML5 drawing application on the web, and it did all these really fancy things, and, but of course you had to use a mouse, right? Loads of people took that idea, and I say took, and they made apps out of it. And every time they made an app, they took a new take on it, and they developed it a bit further, and they said, you know, actually, wouldn't it be better if it did this? There was this whole sort of, if you like, tier of, of painting applications that emerged out of this one person's thinking. And actually, do you know what? He was really bloody angry at first. <laughs> he was like, oh, why, have I, well, why didn't I take advantage of that? You know, he was just like, I, I am really silly. A couple of months later, he came to the conclusion that it was the best thing he'd done in his life. Because actually what he realised was that he was changing the way people were thinking about the iPad. He hadn't even made the thing for the iPad. <laughs> he'd made it for the web. There was another layer beyond that, you know, where people were seeing what had been done and saying, I think I can make something better. It's a kind of conversation that you have with technology, but it's at such a scale that it operates like a conversation instead of 10 months or two year development cycles between each thing. So there's something exciting about the way you can get involved in a conversation that helps develop what these devices are for, for your audiences. Uh, and, I, and I think we should bear that in mind uh, today. So, um, again, I always like to end on a down note, and my down note is this. I've seen, working with lots of arts organisations now, that quite quickly when one talks about a, a future app, a piece of high-end technology, it gets shipped out to fancy agency immediately. It's like, we've got some budget, it's going to be great, we're going to work with fancy agency. Right? Fancy agency have got great ideas and they make some lovely apps. Have a look. You know. 
thing is, you're wasting the creativity in your organisations if you think like that. Not only are you wasting it, you're kind of pissing people off. You know, <laughs> this is what happens. You know, p people, creative people, go to arts organisations and they look at it and they think, why can't we play any role in this development? And the, and, and the answer is, you can. Right? It's just that don't think of everything as a technology problem. Think of it as an experience problem. If you think of it as an experience problem, I bet everyone in your team can play a role. So just have in the back of your mind. Uh, when you're thinking of your apps, and especially later on, how am I going to get everyone back there involved? Anyway, I want to bring uh, Mark up to the stage. There you are, Mark. <laughs> and uh, he, he's going to talk us through some very interesting apps. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. My name is Mark Bamba, and uh, I'm a media trainer for BBC Academy. Um, and this section that I'm going to do today is actually a cut down, you'll be happy to know, of a four hour session. So you're not going to have to sit here for four hours and listen to me dribble on about how exciting mobile is and how exciting apps are. But um, I'm sure that you will find some, some uh, relevance in what I'm going to talk about. So just before we kick off, I would like to, to know how many smart people we have here today. So if you have an Apple phone, would you like to put up your hand so I can see how, wow, excellent. Does anyone have an Android phone? Okay, not as many. I'd say that at least half the people have Apple and um, only about three or four maybe have Android. And, and who has a Windows phone? A couple. What about a BlackBerry? Okay, so there's some corporate people here as well. <laughs> Excellent. And who doesn't even have a smartphone or know what a smartphone is? Wow. Only one shy person who might have a standard phone. Okay, I'm going to kick things off by just talking a little bit about myself. I've been involved in mobile for about 10 years. And originally, I was in uh, the BBC mobile team um, working on the first thing we ever did that had video, which was the Olympic Games in 2004. And I became interested in mobile because at the time, no one knew anything about mobile, which is always good if you're looking for a rise. And the thing about mobile is that since 2004, when I became involved, everyone has been saying it's the year of mobile. This year, it's the year of mobile. And actually, it's taken a long time. And even in the world of TV and video on mobile phones, it isn't quite there yet. However, it really has changed a lot in the last three or four years. So I've gone from editorial content through to advertising. And the last product I worked on with BBC was the iPlayer project on iPad and Android phones. And I must say that during this conversation, this is my personal opinion. It's, uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of the BBC. So if you have any questions about why iPlayer may not be on your particular phone, I won't answer those at the moment. And everyone always asks me when I do these conversations, which phone should I buy or where do I think the market's going? And I think this is a really interesting thing and here's something that might just kick off some thoughts. So Do we have it's sound? This receiver that you put on your dash. So it's pretty cool. Um, basically, it's like $6.99. I think it's kind of expensive, but it's really cool. And the screen is cool. It's like a you put in your make and model, and it's like a mock-up of your dash. And you can do the window, which is cool. Um, oh, that's a navigation screen here. You can also do the door, which is kind of cool. It's pretty sensitive. Like, you can close it, which is cool. Um, so you can actually start the car and just ignition, and then you can go forward. It's pretty sensitive. But it's pretty cool. And then you shift, which is kind of fun. Back with reverse. You can go in reverse and just guide it. Stop the phone, it stops. So, yeah, it's called iCar Remote. It's like $6.99 from the App Store. It's pretty chill. Um, I very much recommend it. Excellent. So, does anyone here think that that is a genuine app? It's about a year old, it's a viral video, um, very entertaining. However, in the last year, these types of things are becoming a reality. And Microsoft have actually done a deal with Toyota 
to put their, um, their software or their operating system into all new Toyotas coming forward. So there will be a point in time soon where you will be able to do really useful things with apps, with your car and all sorts of other appliances, um, and it's happening really, really fast. So before we go too far, um, something to think about is that actually apps now have broken through the mass market and they are mainstream. Um, BBC have been a bit slow at bringing apps to the market, and this is for several reasons in terms of uh, commercialism and also um, you know, some concerns from the market, but even the BBC now do have apps in the marketplace. And what you may find is that some of you guys maybe have apps, or your competitors have apps, um, but they are generally um, absolutely mass market. And if you look in any shop window for a phone company, you'll find that about 75% of phones are smartphones that have been marketed now. And if we have a look at the revolution of mobile, it started off not that long ago with the brick type phones that sometimes even had shoulder straps that you had to carry your bulky phone around. And then we've gone to the, the um, star phone and the big evolution was really for business people when BlackBerry arrived with their email phone. Uh, Nokia had a gaming device called an N-Gage that was maybe a little bit too early for market, but they did have a gaming device. But it was really 2007 when Apple bought out the iPhone, they got everything right at the right time, and really they owned the smartphone market right now. However, there is definitely stiff competition. Um, and I'll talk about some of these phones here because in, from an international point of view and even from a UK view, um, the market is quite different. And in the old days, everyone had a basic phone. Um, it was really cheap to buy and they still exist now. Um, they do text messaging. And actually, you can access the internet with these phones, but they are very poor, very slow. But if you're doing a product or a, a mobile website, for example, in an emerging market, there might still be, and there will still be, a significant amount of people browsing the mobile web with those types of phones. However, they are dying out, and the feature phones are really coming in, or, or they're actually on the way out as well. So these feature phones were where it's at, uh, it was where it was at. You could download things like ringtones, you could have games, they had a camera as well, and also a, an internet mobile experience. And then the smartphones came out, which you really you could download an app on, and an app's really just software um, that you install on your phone to enhance the handset or, or what you're doing with usability. But as I said, the real game changer was the iPhone, touch screen, big hard drive, GPS, so that allows you to find out what your location is, and also something that's really um, important is connection to 3G and also Wi-Fi as well. And the thing about the whole mobile industry is that it's very fragmented. So running across these different types of phones, you can see they're different screen sizes, but also they all run on a different operating system. So in the world where we have PC and Mac, it's very simple to kind of think about what you're going to deliver to those mass market devices or PCs, but it's quite different in the mobile world. So we have Symbian, which is really traditionally Nokia. Um, they are really, um, they've lost a lot of market share to the other um, operating systems such as BlackBerry. Um, but they have recently done a deal with uh, Microsoft to do Microsoft on, say, Nokia phones. So they will be one to watch. I think everyone knows what an iPhone is, what a BlackBerry is. Windows Mobile have reinvented themselves now with something called Windows 7. Um, they have lost a lot of way in terms of how many devices in the market, but they are certainly looking to improve by having this deal with Nokia. Um, also, you have some open source operating systems. You have Palm. There's an um, operating system that's really based in North America called Brew. And also, um, maybe more and more people are hearing about Android. So the thing about apps in particular is that if you want to create an app, in real terms, you need to think about which one of these different operating systems you're going to create your app with. And most people today really are focusing on iPhone and Android apps because they have the biggest market share, even though it is changing. And it's called smart for a reason. And it's really the things that you have on this phone that make it really unique. 
And this is the, some of the reasons why you would want to do an app rather than a mobile website. And from my point of view, everybody should have a site, a mobile presence that works on any phone. So you need to have a look at your website. Does it work on a phone? Maybe you even have a mobile website. That's kind of your first thing to do. But what's really unique, and one of the reasons that you might want to look at doing an app, is that because it can do things like GPS to find your location. You can have video, which you might be able to record. It has obviously sound. They have a camera that can be used as a barcode scanner. So then you can do ticketing. Some of them can have a compass. You can tell which way the person is holding their phone. And these are really great things. And when we talk about um, how you connect with people, we're really talking about something called push and pull. So when you go to a, a mobile website or any sort of service where you pull it, or even Google, and you pull information towards you, that's called pulling. But when you're pushing something to somebody, it's like a, maybe an SMS or an alert or a certain sort of information. That's called a push. And what's really important is getting the whole push and pull right. And that's how you get your communication going because your app is obviously able to connect to the internet, pull down data, and, and do things like um, integrate with your um, maybe things that are around you. And I'll just look at um, a little bit of penetration. In the UK, mobiles per se have about 131% penetration. So most people have one and a half phones. And at the moment, the majority of people, about 36%, I think, are on smartphones. However, in some markets, which I'm, you can probably just see there, it, the penetration is very low. So in Africa and Brazil, you're only talking about 1 or 2% of the population have a smartphone. Most other people that have a mobile phone will have a basic or a feature phone. And if we looked at the UK market, 37% of all UK uh, users now have a smartphone. So that's about 18 million people. So that's your potential audience today. However, in uh, next year, we're hoping for about 50% penetration. So if you have a, uh, an establishment, expect about half the people that enter your premises are going to have a phone that is capable of pulling down data, being able to position using Wi-Fi, using 3G. So it's a very exciting time to be walking around and producing services for these personal computers. And within the next five years, it's predicted that most people will connect to the internet via mobile phones, not via PCs. So it's a really interesting, exciting place to be. And when you look at some of the things that people do with their smartphones, what you might find is that um, if you looked at email, virtually everybody who has a smartphone is going to check their email on it. But if you have a feature phone or a standard phone, you're not really likely to use these types of services. And what's really interesting is we talked about IPTV and how, uh, you know, is that the right thing to be even doing on mobile? Well, actually, um, if you don't have a smartphone, only about 1.7% of the population are even going to consume any video. So it's a tiny, tiny market. However, the, um, the, the uh, consuming TV bit or video bit is really increasing because of the way that people are connecting to these services. And these, um, say, a video content might be with an app, it might be with a mobile website, and more likely than not, you'll either be on 3G, which some people have mixed feelings about in terms of is it a good experience, but actually half the people always connect on their mobile phone at home and generally on a Wi-Fi connection. So it's not always being about out and about, lost, or looking for something to do. It's also a really convenient device to use when you're at home rather than starting up your PC, um, maybe just to check your email or your social ne uh, network status. And the main focus, as I said, has really been on Apple. And they've started, uh, I guess, the revolution as such. And what's interesting here is that this is just somebody predicting what is going to happen in the market, who's going to be the dominant player. And you can see there that the top blue line is Symbian. So that's traditionally been Nokia. And as you can see, now it's probably, or it might be even too late, to sell your Nokia shares because most people predict that they are going to lose a tremendous amount of uh, traffic to their handsets. 
the most predominant player is going to be Android. And everyone kind of agrees that Android now is probably about the same space or the same number of devices in the market as Apple. So the main three players in the market today are actually Apple, Bl um, Blackberry, and Android. Um, and people use different things for different phones. If you're an Apple or an iPhone user, you might find that you use much more content services than someone with an Android phone. It just, and also, if you're a BlackBerry user, you might not even have any apps on your phone because it might be a corporate phone and it's locked, so you can't even install any apps. So it's a kind of a different market. And I just wanted to briefly talk about these different operating systems because it's really important when you think about your app strategy to think about your potential market and about how these different, um, or how the different services might work on these different phones. So these are the dominant players, Apple, BlackBerry, Android, which is obviously um, Google, uh, Symbian, really decreasing, Windows Phone 7, it's a, it's a relatively new version of Windows that only came out in uh, sort of November, December time. Um, Palm doesn't really have that much penetration in the UK, but it has had a reasonable amount of penetration uh, in, in North America. And actually, it's getting even more fragmented and more complicated because there are new players coming to the market like Nokia that are creating their own operating system. So this is uh, really difficult when you're thinking about investing in an app, chances are that it's going to have to be what's called a native build of an app. And that's where software developers create something from the ground up to make sure that it works on these phones. And there are different types of apps. But what I will do before I start on that is just talk about the different languages. So it starts to get fragmented and difficult because each operating system has a different markup language. So it's quite interesting on the web or easy on the web because it's kind of more or less just HTML. However, in the app environment, they have different types of languages that you need to know to create your app. And there are some tools coming that are making this a lot easier. However, at the moment, if you wanted to do a really sharp, fully interactive application, these are the types of skills that your development team or your agency need to know. And actually, to be honest, there is a real shortage of developers. So that's something to be aware of. If you're developing an app, it might take a little bit more time and money than you might think to get it developed because there is a real shortage, skill shortage. And the BBC really focused on creating native apps. So that's something where it, uh, you think about all the interactions you might want and you write the code um, from the ground up, really. But there are different options as well. And if we, if we looked across the top, um, native apps are very rich experience. You can uh, interact with all the features of the phone, such as the camera and the address book, GPS for location. Um, but it's t it takes a lot of time and it's expensive. But you can also do what's called a hybrid, where you create this app and it might go out to the internet and just pull in little bits of web pages. So it kind of still all looks like an app, but it's a mix of both native and more, more a traditional web view. And what if you have a mobile site and you want to get into the, the app stores, you can also do something like create an HTML wrapper. So basically all you're doing is you're wrapping your little mobile site into a little piece of code that allows you to get it into the app store. The users download it, they click the link, but actually all it's really doing is taking you to a mobile website rather than an app. And if you have a mobile website, you might be able to make some changes or even get it into stores um, by doing that way. And the thing that everyone's talking about now are things called widgets. And they are um, something that's developed in what's called HTML5. And it allows you to create a very rich experience, but it's much easier to do than creating a native app. It's faster and it's, less, uh, it's more traditional in the terms of how you build it. And Flash has always been talked about as something that is really cool. It's on the web. Wouldn't it be great if it could work on your phone? The reality with Flash is that actually it's not quite there yet. It's not there on any Apple devices for all sorts of reasons, but it is starting to appear on some mostly Android phones where if you do have 
flash parts on your website or your mobile website, they will actually work. However, it is quite buggy still, and it isn't quite yet the seamless experience it could be. And in terms of video, it does take a lot of processing to do flash video. So it can kind of create some issues with using a lot of battery life on the phone. And the simplest way, if you wanted to get into an app store, would be purely to create a shortcut. And not all app stores allow you to do this, but it's basically just um, a little piece of code that you create, or maybe if you go to a store, like a, um, an independent market that does apps, you can create code there, and it will just go straight to your mobile site. So that's the kind of um, the easiest route. So if you're gonna do cross-platform, it's expensive generally and time consuming. But as I said, there are some things coming. There is no silver bullet, but there are some tools coming that allow you to create apps in a different way where what it will do is the engine, once you've created it, will kind of spit it out for the different versions that you might want to be targeting. But at the moment, this is really an emerging area. And the thing about um, smartphones is that they are really constantly changing. So every three or four months, you're going to get an alert on your smartphone that might give you a whole range of new features to enable your phone to do a whole lot of new great things. So if you do um, start creating uh, apps, you really need to think about what is your long-term strategy. Because every three or four months, for every operating system, you need to ensure that your app still works. And if you're someone like the BBC, they have lots of content coming in via feeds, and you may also do content coming from feeds where if anything breaks, it can cause all sorts of problems. And actually what happens is if you build an app, it can take a long time for it to get approved and, uh, and updated. And each operating system really has its own app store. And all you guys will probably be familiar with these. Apple have their own. Um, Android market have their own, and there are some independent ones also, not, not on the Apple side, but on the other um, operating systems that allow you to create um, um, or put your apps into the app stores. And the amount of apps that people have, on average, is 37 if you have an iPhone, and only about 10 if you have a feature phone or a Blackberry. So really, the big numbers, are, or the, the sort of the social um, consumption of apps is really centered purely in the iPhone or Apple world. And actually what's interesting is that the most popular apps aren't really what you would call utility apps that do things, they're actually games. And games have been around for a long time, um, but you know, they are classified as an app. And the future of apps it's really interesting because it's not really just about smartphones, it's about all sorts of devices that are coming, including in-car stereos, um, tablets, which everyone knows about, and also you're going to be able to create um, plugins for your smartphone or your tablets that make it much more like a PC. So you will be able to walk around, or well you can now, with more or less a portable P uh, PC in your pocket. Just to finish off, on some BBC apps, uh, we do two types of apps. We've uh, really classified apps as two different things. Enduring apps, which is something that really is going to last a, a long time. They are um, things like BBC News, BBC Sport, iPlayer. And then there are more apps that are much more topical, things like Glastonbury, Doctor Who, or World Cup. But BBC don't really do any topical apps at the moment. We are really focused on enduring apps, something that is high quality, that people will keep coming back and using. And I'm sure that some of you have already seen these, but these are the um, iPad news sites. Um, they've been very successful. It's available in the UK. It's available uh, externally as well, um, outside the UK, and it has banner advertising, which you can see just on the right-hand side. We also have it available on iPhone. And BBC iPlayer is the most recent app that's been developed, and that's available on iPad, and also Android phones. And we talked about uh, a little bit about um, you know, apps that uh, maybe have a, a shorter shelf life, like Glastonbury. And for BBC, 
most of that stuff really lives with BBC Worldwide rather than BBC UK. But there are a range of different food and um, children's apps that are available. And the greatest threat, I think, for, for smartphones today is really, it used to be data plans, network work speed, and battery life, which was concerning everyone, which is still kind of there. But I think the base, uh, critical thing that we need to get right is fake apps, viruses, and sharing your location with social networking. People need to be a little bit more wary about that, telling their Facebook status that they're on holiday for two weeks, and it might have their address as well. It's probably not a great thing to do. And also security on Wi-Fi networks. Um, if you are connecting to a Wi-Fi network, you need, really need to make sure that it's secure um, because it is potentially possible that people can um, intercept all of your um, uh, emails and messages as well. So these are my three top tips. You need to ensure that your mobile website works on, or your website works on mobile first before you consider apps because most people, the mass market, are, are not connecting via apps just yet. They are more likely to hit your site with uh, your website. And apps are really a commitment. So they could be useful or it could be a, um, a gameplay, but they are a commitment. You can't just launch it and then expect not to have any more investment in it. And also, just really consider your marketing. There's about 250,000 apps in the iPhone or iTunes store you need to really work about how you're going to get your apps in front of mind for people when you develop them. Because that, you know, I worked with a lot of organisations where they spend lots of money building a very complicated app that does really great things, but there is no marketing budget and no one downloads it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.